There are two major categories of top investment bank. We have bulge brackets and elite boutiques. If you were to look at a list of the top investment banks by total M&A, you'd see that they fall into one of these two categories. In this video, we're going to dissect bulge brackets, what constitutes a bulge bracket, what their business model is like, and pros and cons of working for one. So here we have a list of the top investment banks. Now of this top 10, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Citi, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, and Barclays are definitively bulge brackets. These are the largest investment banks in the world by virtually any metric. They do the largest deals, they have the highest deal volume, they have the most offices, the most employees. By any standard, these are really the largest firms. So let's dive right in. What is a bulge bracket? Well, the term bulge bracket is an industry term that refers to the largest global diversified investment banks in the world. Now, these bulge brackets are diversified firms, meaning they have different business units and they also are geographically spread out. And you can contrast that to smaller investment banks and smaller boutiques, which might be more geographically focused. For example, a firm like RBC or Macquarie is growing on a global scale, but they're still only considered number one in a couple of geographies, while the remaining bulge brackets are considered number one or are in that top echelon around the world. Now, the key distinguishing factor between bulge brackets and elite boutiques comes down to their business model. Elite boutiques focus on M&A or restructuring and do what is known as advisory, while these bulge bracket investment banks do much more. Bulge brackets, of course, can still do M&A. They'll still advise on large transactions on both the buy side and the sell side, but they also offer a lot of other services. They could provide the debt financing to secure the acquisition. They could have their equity research team publish reports on your stock. Their sales and trading function could help you buy shares if you're a hedge fund or private equity firm. You can essentially think about a bulge bracket as a one-stop shop for all your corporate finance needs. Many of these bulge brackets also have private wealth management arms, as well as consumer facing arms. Bank of America and JP Morgan obviously have very large consumer arms in the United States. To really illustrate the point, here are some of the key front office functions and examples for each. So in traditional investment banking advisory, that is what Evercore or Center you could also do. You could do something like advising Salesforce on the acquisition of Tableau software. So you would be advising a large technology company on the acquisition of another business. In investment banking, financing, you might help Apple issue bonds in the debt capital markets. It's easier to do this because as a bulge bracket, you can actually help underwrite deals more effectively. These bulge brackets can also help you find other buyers because they're much closer to the capital markets or help you price the transaction. And here we're touching on probably the biggest business model difference between elite boutiques and bulge brackets. And that's that bulge brackets have what's known as a balance sheet. They have a lending balance sheet and can use that balance sheet in order to get deals, in order to lend money to clients. Now, if you think about it like this, bulge brackets resemble more closely to what you think of a traditional bank, a big institution with lots of money that can lend it out. Now, on the other hand, elite boutiques, they're more like advisors. They can give you advice on what to do and the best way to do it, but they can't actually give you the money. Bulge brackets, on the other hand, that's a big part of their business model doing this investment banking financing. So now let's ask the question, who are the bulge brackets? And it might seem like there's a concrete list of bulge brackets, but it's often debated, especially in recent years, people have been clamoring that Deutsche Bank and UBS are not bulge brackets. And I'll just offer potentially an empirical view on this question. It's actually a lot more like sports when you're debating who is the greatest of all time, who is better than who, as opposed to a rigid list of banks. In doing research for this, I actually traced the origin of the term bulge bracket to this book called House of Morgan from 1990. And get ready for who they call the bulge brackets. So they actually named the following banks, Morgan Stanley, First Boston, Quinn Loeb, and Dylan Reed. Now of those, the only one that is still in the same format is Morgan Stanley. First Boston would eventually merge with Credit Suisse, Quinn Loeb merged with Lehman Brothers and Dylan Reed was acquired by UBS. And I think the takeaway is that empires rise and fall. Even Goldman Sachs, which I think most people would recognize as the number one player in investment banking today, probably was not definitively the number one player even before the financial crisis. So these things change, definitions change, and it's just an interesting thing to be aware of. Nevertheless, if it's a ranking you want, it's a ranking you will get. So what I tried to do was look at all these top investment banks across a variety of metrics. The first metric is global M&A deal value. So this is the total value of all of the M&A acquisitions that they're advising on. This includes both the buy side and the sell side. And it's my view in the industry that people really think about M&A when they're thinking about traditional investment banking. In contrast, if you were to focus and rank this on financing, you're going to get some very balance sheet oriented firms like HSBC and BNP Paribas, which 
which although are great firms, I think don't represent the true ethos of Vulture Bracket investment banking. Next, of course, we're going to have global investment banking revenue. So this includes everything from M&A, IPOs, financing. To really finesse the point on scale, I've also included total revenue. Now this is gonna cover all divisions, including things like the consumer arm, so it's less valuable, but it's still an interesting data point. Fourth, I'm going to have a column for prestige or industry perception, and I'm just gonna take the ranking from Vault. I actually think Vault is remarkably good at doing what they do, and when I was reading this list, I think it actually maps very closely to what offers people would take over different firms. And finally, of course, we'll apply the business model filter so Evercore and Lazard are not on this list. So if you're looking at the ranking of global M&A deal value, you first have Goldman, then Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. And Goldman and Morgan Stanley are actually quite close in M&A deal value, which I don't think would surprise anyone in the industry. Now, one thing to point out is that if you look at global IBD revenue, JP Morgan is actually first. And that's because they do so much financing. They have this huge balance sheet and underwrite so many of the deals on Wall Street, and that's why they end up doing more despite having less M&A revenue. Now, below these four banks, we have Citi, Credit Suisse, and Barclays. Now, I would still classify all three of these as bulge brackets, but you can see there's a clear demarcation in how much less IBD revenue and M&A deal value they have. If you look at the global M&A deal value and look at percentage of number one, Citi has less than half of the M&A deal value as Goldman, and Barclays has about 30% of Goldman Sachs's M&A deal value. And I actually didn't have this perception going in, but in my mind, there's almost two tiers of bulge brackets. We have the first four firms, and then we have Citi, Credit Suisse, and Barclays. And honestly, based off the screen, I would not consider UBS or Deutsche Bank to be bulge brackets. In my opinion now, they're much more like upper middle market banks, the firms themselves have de-emphasized the importance of investment banking, and I think they're just so different from this other list of firms that it wouldn't be appropriate to include them. Now, in the second tier of bulge brackets, each of these firms has faced their own challenges. Citi's investment banking M&A revenue has declined on a year-over-year -year basis. Credit Suisse had the huge scandal with Archegos Capital and has consistently been urged to shut down their investment banking division. And Barclays, it seems, doesn't have the geographic scale as these other firms. Although they are dominant in Europe, they're not quite as prominent in other parts of the world, and they've pulled out of Asia and Russia, and I just think that their investment banking revenue is also not as robust. Now with the brutal assessment of bulge brackets aside, let's now talk about the pros and cons of working for a bulge bracket. So the first pro I would identify for a bulge bracket is that there's a much stronger brand outside of finance. If you want to go to work for tech or politics or another industry that knows nothing about finance, an elite boutique is not going to have the same brand recognition. Now, if the process has a headhunter, they'll probably still know which elite boutiques are good. But if you are going to a different part of the world, there's a good chance that they're not going to know what like Centerview or Evercore is. And there actually are a lot of situations in which I think a well-recognized brand can help you, but not always the case if they worked at an elite boutique. And on a more vain level, there's definitely that idea of social value. You know, if you go to a cocktail party or meet random people, they're more likely to know what Goldman or Morgan Stanley is versus an elite boutique. Literally no one will care if you worked at a top group at Evercore unless you are at like an NYU grad party. Now secondly, I think the biggest professional difference is that you get a lot more exposure to different categories in finance at a bulge bracket. I would say the biggest regret of my investment banking career is that I never got to work on an IPO or a big financing. I was always working on M&A or some kind of strategic advice. So if you are at a good industry group at a bulge bracket, you're much more likely to get exposed to all these different kinds of deals, all these different kinds of projects. Now, I don't think it's a huge deal, but I did notice that when I got to private equity that I was less comfortable dealing with complicated debt instruments because I spent all of my time doing technology M&A. Thirdly, I would say there's a larger professional network. There's simply just more employees and there's more offices and more history at these bulge brackets. So there's a higher chance that you're gonna meet someone at the same firm as you. And I think there's just a little bit more of that professional connection there. Now it's definitely a spectrum because I feel like when I do meet someone from my firm, it's more of a special connection and I'm more likely to know the alumni from my firm. But I would say as a whole, your professional network is gonna be a lot larger at one of the top firms. Another big thing is that there's more lateral opportunities at these bulge brackets. You know, these bulge brackets oftentimes will also run asset management divisions. They'll also have more offices around the world. So if you think you might want to move back home, there's a higher chance that a bulge bracket is going to have an office where you live. For example, I'm from Canada and lots of people try to move back to Toronto after working in the States. And virtually all the bulge brackets will have offices and a number of employees, but not all of the elite boutiques do. You know, Centerview and Molas don't have Toronto offices. And lastly, I would say there's more corporate infrastructure at 
bulge brackets. So these are very, very specific examples, but bulge brackets will have things like presentation groups and better kind of book binding services. While at an elite boutique, sometimes it doesn't always feel like you have the most professional resources and you might be relatively understaffed. So there are a couple of key cons of working for a bulge bracket. I think the most obvious one is that they tend to pay slightly less. It might just be 10 to 15% at the analyst level, but I think it really does scale over time. From a high level, elite boutiques tend to pay a larger percentage of their profits to their employees, and that's kind of the incentive that they have to get people to join them. You know, they pay more salary. The other main reason why people leave bulge brackets is because it tends to be much harder to climb the ladder. A lot of these bulge brackets are much older, meaning that there's lots more partners, it's harder to get a piece of the economic pie. You'll often see there's a huge glut of people at these firms that can't break into the MD level or the partner level, and they can get stuck for a lot longer. Elite boutiques are generally newer and oftentimes run much leaner, so if you are a capable person, I think on a relative level it's easier to climb at an elite boutique. And finally, from a cultural perspective, I've heard that bulge brackets are much more bureaucratic. You know, there's a lot more red tape. A lot of discussions are highly politicized. And as a result of having so many different business divisions, you know, there's a lot of competing interests. For example, the financing team might want to put even more debt on a business, but the M&A team might think that's a bad idea. And you just have all these competing interests that can make it difficult to get deals done. So in closing, I think there are quite a few differences between working at a bulge bracket and elite boutique. I think the biggest thing for me is that if you think you're going to be doing a public facing thing or if you're going to you know leave finance it might be marginally better to be at a bulge bracket with all that being said i do think there are enough benefits of working at an elite boutique you can check out the video we did on elite boutiques if you are curious and i would actually take a top elite boutique over most of the bulge brackets and i said this before but i would probably take goldman and morgan stanley over everything but then i would take the top elite boutiques over any of the remaining bulge brackets. So I do think when you are thinking about which offers to take, it's more than just this division of business model. If you're at an investment bank already and you're curious about private equity recruiting, you should really check out the course on our website that'll teach you LBO modeling and how to build a case study properly. Thanks for watching the video and I will see you in the next one.